Hello, and welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. This is episode 26. It is February 20th, 2015, and I'm Elizabeth. I think that's it. No, I need to say. <laughs> You'd think I'd have kind of a patter by now. Uh, but you can find me as Dark Matter Knits on all of the social medias. I know that's not the correct plural. And uh, it's like internets, you know, if you're over 40, you should put inappropriate plurals on these things. Anyway, you can find me as Dark Matter Knits on Ravelry, uh, Instagram. Those are really where I spend the most time, but Twitter. I'm at darkmatternits.com online. So hello. It's been a couple of weeks since I last saw you, as usual, this being a bi- bi-weekly podcast and all. And uh, I've got a lot to talk to you about, but I am going to try to keep this kind of short today because I got, I have a lot to talk to you about and I have a lot of things to do, <laughs> but I always love talking with you. So it's always a bit of a push and pull, but I need to go over today and buy myself a dress, which to some of you may sound like a lovely thing to do on a Friday afternoon. To me, it is like nails on a chalkboard torture. Number one, I don't wear dresses very often. I just don't, I'm not a skirt and dress kind of person. And number two, I hate clothes shopping. The reason I need to buy a dress, I will talk about a little later on in the episode, Uh, but suffice it to say, I suffer for my art. (laughs) Anyways, the theme for today is the design process. And I thought I would talk about this because uh, I've been spending a lot more time recently on my own knitting design, which I've been really excited about having some more time to do. And I know that some of you have designed patterns before and many of you haven't. And so I just thought it'd be interesting to talk about, you know, what what goes into the making of a pattern and the the kind of life of, of a pattern when you're on the design side of things. I think it's, I've learned a lot about it in the last five or so, well, how long, how long have I been designing? I guess about 10 years. No, not quite that long. Anyway, uh, I've learned a lot about it through trial and error and self-teaching. And, uh, and I just thought it you know, whether you ever plan on designing or not, it's an int- it's interesting to know a little bit about the behind the scenes on the, that process. Um, but before we get to that, I don't have a review for today, but I will for next time. I have a lovely book called Canadian Art Deco Knits by Natalie Servant that I will be reviewing next time. It is gorgeous. Okay, so, oh, and I will have a technique segment for you that is... Uh, prompted by one of you who sent me an email, and sorry, I am now looking up, that was the Martini Knitter, Sarah, gave me a really good idea for what to do for the technique segment today. You were very timely, Sarah, (laughs) because it was pretty much right before I was recording, and I was thinking, what am I going to do for a technique segment today? And there was your email. So thank you for doing my work for me. (laughs) Um, So let's do our announcement-y things before we get started. We have some giveaways from or a giveaway from last time, and a new one for this time that I want to tell you about. So first up is, if you recall, last time, this was our giveaway that I announced last time, Bags by Awesome Granny. This is a set that comes together that she will be shipping straight to you. And uh, this one is large enough to possibly to hold a sweater, kind of depends on how chunky the sweater is and uh, how big it is. Uh, I have about four rather large skeins in here right now and it is doing, and a book and a couple other things. So it's doing quite fine holding it. Uh, And there is a notions pouch, uh, coordinating notions pouch that comes with it with, and both have this very cool lining in it or a coordinating fabric inside. And this is the maker of these bags, Darlene. Now, she says that, uh, if you recall from last time, that she has a coupon code just for us, DMK, all capitals, DMK10, which will give you 10% off of anything in her shop. Uh, 
don't worry <laughs> for the person who wins this this is not going the one that I have crammed all of my stuff into is not yours Starling will be mailing yours you yours directly so the winner of that which I drew beforehand is uh, catnip who is Catherine from Atlanta and uh, the question I asked you all to answer was uh, what is something that you could use a project bag for or do you use project bags for besides holding knitting projects or crochet projects. And uh, Catnip said, such great fabric on this one. I've only been using my project bags for knitting up until now, but I could see using them for other crafts like card making or scrapbooking. Might make good storage for washi tape or my Copic markers. I have no idea what that means, not being a scrapbooker or a card maker, but I have a feeling it has something to do with those. If you think of it, come tell us what those are. <laughs> I suppose I could also just Google it. Uh, but congratulations, Catnip. And um, if you're wondering, I, I know some podcasters do like do the random number generator right while you're watching. And um, and I think it was the Knit Girls who started doing that and everybody else just kind of copied them. And I think it may be because somebody got really snarky with the Knit Girls once about thinking that they were drawing just their friends. And so they started doing the drawings live so that, as Leslie put it, puts it, you won't think that she's cheating. Seriously? <laughs> I'm not blaming Leslie and Laura for this, but if, if you think that podcasters are cheating and drawing for their prizes, then, and, and you actually take the time to contact a podcaster about this, you probably have bigger problems than they do. I'm just going to keep doing the drawings off the air. <laughs> I think that's fine. Don't you? I, I do. Like I say, I don't blame anybody for doing it that way. I'm just explaining why I don't. Alrighty. So, uh, new giveaway. We have, ooh, you know what? I'm going to need to pause this because I want to show you a picture of the pattern that we're going to be doing a giveaway for. Hang on. Okay. So here is our new giveaway, the lovely Christine Beeson of the Yarnings podcast, which if you haven't seen, you should definitely go take a look at. Uh, Christine has just designed this lovely cowl called Harmonize. Let's see if I can get it a little closer there. This is a, a cowl that is designed for fingering weight yarns. This is a sheep spot hand dyed yarn that she's done one of the samples in and it either comes in this long version that you can then double up around your neck which I especially like or there is another version that is shorter and just fits in a single sort of collar like layer around your neck very pretty lovely feather and fan and garter stitch uh, lace a bit of lace work. Nothing too complicated. If you've not done lace before, I think this would be, or if you've not done much lace, this would be a, a great place to start because it has both charted and written instructions. <laughs> and, uh, sorry, I'm laughing at myself, not at what I'm saying. Uh, has charted and written instructions and the lace is not overly complicated. And it, let's see, uses... It's really good for using, like if you really want to use all of a skein, it looks like the longer version uses 325 yards of a fingering weight, whereas the shorter one uses 200 yards. So if you had one of those fingering weight skeins that is you know, just enough for one sock, it'd be perfect for the short one. And if you have a standard fingering weight skein, it would be more than enough for the long one. And she even gives you tips about how you can lengthen the longer cowl so you could just go ahead and use up all the yarn. Really nice project and um, I just think, look at, look at her. She is such a sweetheart. Truly good, good soul. So thank you Christine for uh, sending me a copy of, of this pattern. I'm really looking forward to tending this at some point and she has very kindly offered to give away a copy of this pattern, a PDF copy. PDF copy? This is coffee. <laughs> you will get a copy. How about I have more coffee? And then finish my sentence. 
she has very generously offered to send a PDF copy to one of you, and we will open one of the standard prize threads on the Dark Matter Knits group on Ravelry. And the question that I asked her if she had a specific question that she would like me to ask, and I loved what she responded. She said, how about you have them tell us about a combination that harmonizes that you didn't expect to, like peanut butter and jelly being seemingly contrasting, but they work. In my life, she says, board games plus knitting, lace weight plus tunic length garment, raindrops plus flowers. So think of some combination of two things that you think work well together, even though on the face of it they shouldn't. And uh, and that will be, you say that as your post in the, in the thread. One entry per person must be a member of the group, etc. And I will do the drawing before uh, the next podcast. All right. So that's cool. And like I say, check out Christine's Yarnings podcast. She is a, uh, a very sweet and upbeat person and always is doing something very interesting with her knitting and uh, really has a thoughtful knitting process. I love the, what, what, she com- what she comes out with is really beautiful. She makes lovely things. And, uh, and she's also really into gaming, like I am. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a good, good one to check out. It's a video podcast. So those are my announcements for the week. What have I been up to and knitting on? I actually have things to show you this week. I've been doing mostly design knitting, but I have, I do have a few things to show you and talk to you about. So last weekend, I went to the Texas Winter Fiber Fun Retreat. Say that 10 times fast. I'm not going to. I will just say it once. No, I'll say it twice. The Texas Winter Fiber Fun Retreat is held every year in Denton, Texas, which is in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And it is run by uh, Mary Berry, who runs the Fancy Fibers shop. She is a uh, uh, raises animals and sells their their fiber and other people's fiber. And she actually also used to be the person who ran Kidney, which is the fiber festival in Bernie. She may still, I think, I think she has handed that over to someone else though. At any rate, this is a wonderful retreat. It is now uh, a little under a hundred people, uh, all women as it turns out. And although it's not, certainly not exclusive to women. And it pulls people from I'd say probably anywhere in a four, five, six hour radius. I'm probably one of the people that comes from the furthest. Uh, I'm coming from Austin, which is about three and a half hours away. And uh, it's a, a kind of a full fiber retreat. So there are some vendors, but mostly it's classes and just sitting around, hanging out, doing fiber things. There are a lot of knitters, some crocheters, and really mostly spinners. So if you're looking for a retreat, and you're somewhere nearby to Dallas, and uh, and you're looking for something where you can really meet some other spinners, then this is a good one for you. I lied. I am not one of the people who comes from farthest away. There is a group that come from comes from Mississippi, so they win. <laughs> uh, and I'm always glad to see them. Donna Payton is one of the people who comes, and I just always love seeing her. And I got to meet. Uh, Well, I got to see some old friends and I got to meet some new people this year. Uh, One of whom I was really excited to meet is Pat, who is a viewer of the podcast and uh, who I mentioned last week. And uh, and she was at the retreat and she took both of my classes and she is completely lovely. I so enjoyed spending time with her. She's one of those people that, you know how you just, you meet people sometimes and you just instantly feel like yeah, I could just sit next to you for the rest of the weekend and be perfectly happy. <laughs> just want, It was like that. So it was really, really nice. I love, it's really nice after I had had an extremely busy week, like frantic week before that. So, you know, I kind of showed up breathless and then taught eight hours of class. <laughs> it was finally able to kind of decompress in the latter part of the uh, the retreat. But yeah, it was it was super fun, and um, and while I was there, I worked on oh so many bags. 
I can get it. <laughs> Hang on, I'm gonna have to go get another bag. Okay. <sighs> I thought I had everything together and apparently I did not. So you may recall that I was working on, I think on New Year's Day, I started knitting a project with this skein set from Willy Wonka Fibers. It's a transitional skein set, so it's not technically a gradient. Um, and in fact, some of her skein sets really don't look like gradients at all. Uh, they're just, you know, four different colors that harmonize well together. But it's basically um, four different colors, a hundred yards of each. So it's fingering weight yarn that uh, all together is the size of uh, a standard skein of sock yarn, but uh, broken up into four different colors that transition well together. So uh, this one is called, the colorway is called Rolling in the Deep, and it is a 100% superwash wool. So, you know, to my mind, a little better for a shawl than, say, socks, because there's no nylon in here to kind of help strengthen the wool. So, uh, and I've been kind of on a scarf-shaped shawl kick recently anyway. So this is what I'm making. As you can see, I've finished the... I'll get to the pattern in a moment. But I finished the the first color and I have started working on the second color. The pattern that I'm knitting is called A Certain Slant by Stitchner Designs. Here's her photograph of her finished shawl, which as it turns out is in probably influenced my thinking is the color is very similar to mine. Uh, I'll show you another example. I saw there are a number of these that are are done in gradients. So I thought this would make a, a good project for this. Um, I had started on New Year's Day, I had started knitting a striped shawl. And I just wasn't loving it. It wasn't anything to do with the pattern. I just, uh, it just, it, I didn't feel like it was setting off the yarn as well as I wanted it to. So I just decided to start over. And um, so I, this is pretty much what I knit on while I was at the retreat. So that is, oh my gosh, I've got stuff everywhere. This is my work desk too, so. You know, it's kind of hard to keep everything straight sometimes. All right, so that is going out of our way. Another thing that I just started today, actually, actually, let me get to that in a moment because that kind of transitions into the next thing I want to talk about. Let me show you my spinning instead. Now, this is going to be a little challenging. Oh, you know what? <laughs> just pick up the phone. <laughs> All right, moving gently so you don't barf. All right, so there is my spinning wheel, my lovely Kromsky Minstrel, which is a, let's get this out of the way, a double treadle. Can you see that? No, oh, there's my little treadles, little pedals. And I am spinning this, which is October House Fiber that I've got at Arkansas Fiber Fest. And it looks like this Ooh, pretty it is a, a superwash merino bamboo nylon blend and it's really it spins up relatively fine I'm thinking what I'm going to do with this I have split it into three three equal or equal ish parts and I'm going to uh, spin spin each third up into singles and then three ply it. I don't know why that was so hard to say. I've never done a three ply before, so I'm really curious to see how that comes out. Uh, I guess I just decided, I, I think I really want a nice uh, plump hat out of it. So um, I wanted the three ply to kind of give it a little more, give the yarn a little more roundness so that it would show the stitches a little better. I've tried knitting hats with my hand spun that is just two ply and it, it just looked a little flat. So that's what I'm going to try this time. We'll see how that goes. Uh, the last thing I've been knitting on, and this will transition into sort of my main topic for today. This is not something I'm designing, by the way. That's not quite where this is going. 
This is a hat that somebody else designed, actually. One that you've probably heard about before if you watch a number of podcasts. Uh, it's a hat designed by Megan Williams. I'm not very far along on it, and it's in dark purple, so <laughs> you're not really going to be able to see much at the moment. But this is uh, Megan Williams's uh, Measure in Love, which is a, a hat with a very sweet and poignant story behind it. Her, it's, her sister died at a very young age, and the, the proceeds from this hat go to supporting women's health research. The reason I am knitting this hat is that uh, I have a photo shoot set up for tomorrow. Hopefully it'll happen tomorrow. The weather's being a little iffy. Uh, but a photo shoot set up for tomorrow for a new design of mine. And one of my... Normally I would have uh, my new business partner, Anne Podlesack, the one from Wooly Wonka Fibers, the one that I do stitch definition with. Uh, I would normally ask her to do my photography, ship the stuff out to her in New Mexico and have her shoot it. But in this case, I made the sweater in my size and I'm going to be modeling it, which is why I'm buying the dress. <laughs> and, um, and so my friend who is a photographer, my friend Nell is, uh, going to do the photography and she very kindly offered to basically do a trade in services. Like I knit her a hat and she does these photographs for me and we're square which is great. I would, I, I would happily knit her a hat. So she, her, um, she lives kind of out in the country and she's, uh, has, has horses and, you know, kind of like me is not a very frilly person. So I thought that the, the kind of, um, dark neutral color and the design is, um, it's pretty, but it's not super feminine. So I think it will, I think it will suit her well. So the hat is for her and I'm hoping to finish it by tomorrow. <laughs> so I can just hand it to her. If not, I don't think she's, I don't think she'll be that peeved, but I would like to be able to give her the hat tomorrow. Uh, the sweater I'm working on, I wish I could show it to you now, but I would like to kind of keep it under wraps until the reveal date, which is at the end of this month. Uh, but I can tell you that it is a, a sweater design that will come in a wide range of sizes. It's in 12 sizes, I think from, if I'm remembering correctly, it's from 32 inches up to 54 inches. And uh, it is a cardigan knit in fingering weight yarn that falls about mid hip, but has fronts that are a little lower and has uh, lace panels on the, uh, down the fronts and down the sleeves. And it is worked, uh, there's no seaming other than a little bit under the underarm. So it's, uh, you know, it's done all in one piece. It's knit bottom up, but it's done all in one piece. And I really, really love it. It's, I've designed it out of Knit Circus's uh, new gradient yarn. I seem to be doing a lot of gradient stuff lately. I think it's kind of a thing. It's not just me. And, uh, yeah, it's, I gotta say, it's... <laughs> Modesty aside, it is gorgeous. It may be the, my favorite thing I've ever designed. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> more about that later. Or, more, yeah, more about that when I can actually show it to you. The other thing that I have been designing recently is what I'm wearing. It's my hat. This is the Blocade cap. Sorry if my Italian pronunciation is terrible. That means uh, bloccare is B-L-O-C-C-A-R-E and it means block in Italian because it's a color block hat. Here, let me show you what it looks like. <laughs> Hello, hat head. So this is what it looks like from the top. It's five different colors of a sport weight wool yarn and it is worked sideways. You do a provisional cast on. I can't remember exactly where I started. I think it was with the burgundy. I don't know. Uh, you start with a provisional cast on along one of these colors, work it sideways, and you use short rows to shape the crown as you go. And uh, there are little short stripes and long 
sections of each color. And by the time you, there are instructions for several sizes, but by the time you get all the way around, finished all the colors, it is big enough to fit around your head. You then Kitchener that closed, or you can do a three needle bind off if you want. Um, but you close that up so it's all one continuous circle now. Pick up stitches along the bottom and work the brim and rib. I really like this hat. It is a hat that <laughs> this is not a good idea. This is not how you generally wear them. It's a good look, don't you think? <laughs> no. You pull it down in the back. Then it looks then it looks better. So this is a uh, design that was put out by Nitpicks just yesterday. And it is part of their 2015 Spring Accessories Collection. And there are 25 other patterns in the book. It's really gorgeous. Uh, there are some great patterns in there. Um, I, I want to tell you before I get into the design process that we are going to have a knit along for this hat because uh, more so than I thought, people have been really enthusiastic about this hat. People really seem to like it. So I'm going to do a knit along and it's going to start on March 1st, so pretty soon. And uh, I've got all the details on the Ravelry group about what you'll need and where to get it and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, there will be prizes, of course, and it will last, it will run through April 15th. So there'll be plenty of time to get a hat done. But, you know, I, I realize you all are working on other things and some, sometimes people get to, get to it later. So I just kind of wanted to leave plenty of time to get it done. Um, so yeah, March 1st to April 15th on the website. So backing up a little bit, I wanted to talk about the design process, kind of specifically for this hat, but also in general, to give you some idea about what goes into something like this. Because, you know, just knitting a hat like this for me is, you know, it can, it can take as little as a day, as much as a week to knit a hat. Um, but there's a lot more that goes into... The designing of something like this. So the way it worked for this was that Knit Picks periodically, I'd say probably about eight to ten times a year maybe, puts out calls for design. So that's that's more than most yarn companies do. Uh, they have a running call for designs in their independent designer program, which is where you just say, hey, I just thought of this idea. I'd like to knit it Knit Picks yarn. Here's my proposal. And um, and they either do thumbs up or th thumbs down, and then send you the yarn to knit it up. Uh, and then you make all the yarn, all the uh, proceeds from the sales of that pattern on their website, and can sell it on your own. But they also have patterns that are theirs, that are knit picks patterns that they are that then they then commission from designers, and that's what this is. So it's a slightly different thing. And um, so they they send out a a mood board and a description of what they're looking for. So in this case, and usually what they have is like a list of colors and yarns that you can choose from. There's a palette. So usually something like seven, eight, nine colors and, uh, and a list of yarns that you can choose from. And that way in the photography, it all looks coordinated. Uh, so these were colors that were in their in their palette, they wanted them to be you know have kind of a springy look to them, um, and you know obviously they wanted accessories. This being an accessories collection, so uh, I really like hats, so I proposed this hat. And in fact, hang on, let me pause this. I'm going to show you a copy of the proposal that I sent in. Okay, so here is here is what I sent them. Bah. I sent them a, they, they always want a one page proposal. And I did this drawing of what the hat might look like. You can see that a couple of things have changed slightly, uh, including the main thing being that the brim, I decided to, since there was so much color going on, I decided to make the brim mostly a, the most neutral color in the hat, just to kind of tone it down a little bit. 
but they sent me the colors that I requested in Wool of the Andes Sport. And then over here, which you probably can't see, is that I just gave them a design overview, uh, which basically just kind of describes how the hat's done. Well, it, actually, it's design overview and garment construction. So it's kind of how the hat is made, kind of a basic overview of that, and, uh, and you know, why it's good in a spring collection. And then there's a short bio at the bottom and all my uh, contact information. And I should say that uh, if you are thinking about doing designing, you don't need to do, I mean, I, I created this illustration in Illustrator. Uh, you don't need to do anything like that. I've submitted pencil sketches. However, you do want to go over pencil sketch in pen, like sketch it out in pencil, but then do the outlines over again in pen just to make it look a little better. But I have certainly done, you know, rough sketches like that. And you do not need to be a great artist you do not need to be a great artist to convey what you're trying to get across. Uh, yeah, so that's what I that's what I sent in, and then I found out not long after they're they're good about moving this process along pretty quickly. Uh, found out not long after that uh, that the design had been accepted, which I was super excited about, and. Um, and interestingly, the way the the payment structure with these kinds of commission designs work is that they, and th this is a, a relatively standard arrangement, the yarn company in this case pays you outright a, a set sum of money. Um, in this case, it was $450, I'll just tell you. Um, they pay you a set sum of money to have exclusive rights to sell the design for two years, I think. Is it one year or two years? I think it's one year, actually. Uh, but they have an exclusive rights to sell the design for a set period of time, and that's what they're paying for. And then eventually, often, the rights go back to you. In some cases, that's not true. In the case of my Colonel Henley pattern, for instance, that I did for Spud and Chloe, they just, they paid me for the pattern and now it's theirs. It will never be mine again. So that's one of the things to realize about, especially uh, yarn companies and magazines and books usually, is that the designer is getting being paid one lump sum, sometimes is never getting the rights back. So like in this case, it's not really like, if I'm trying, if you know, if I, to tell you about a knit along, it's not really going to earn me any more money. It's just that I like it when people knit my designs. And um, and I like for nitpicks to see that people are interested in my designs. So, you know, it does behoove me to have a knit along. But um, it's not like every time somebody buys a pattern, something shows up in my PayPal account. It doesn't work like that in this case. So... That's how the payment thing works. They actually, in this case, Nitpicks pays you half up front and half when the book comes out, which is which is, was yesterday. Um, and then eventually I get the rights back and I can, a year from now, and then I can sell the pattern as well. So it's, an, it's a really nice arrangement. Nitpicks is good to their designers. Um, and then, so what Nitpicks does, and this is somewhat unusual, is that they, in fact, I'm not sure anybody else does this, they send you yarn to knit up a sample. That's what this is. It's my sample. And um, and that way you can kind of test out your own design as you're writing it. But the pattern, the, but the uh, sample that is photographed for the book is actually knit by one of their sample knitters. Which is nice because uh, that means somebody else is kind of testing the pattern. And also in this case, I kind of liked the color combination that they they came up with better than I liked my own. I was going off of their color palette, and um, and while they were too, I just I really liked how it came out. I'm sorry, I'm stalling for a second because I want to show you. Um, what theirs looks like. The one color in here that I'm not as sure about is the salmon color, and uh, and that actually got taken out. Well, that and so their 
their hat that they photographed is in those colors. It's in kind of a teal, a gray, same gray as I'm wearing, the same, or no, I'm not wearing yellow. No, I'm not. The same burgundy that I have, but then a yellow, a teal, and a white. I really like how, how theirs came out, and the sample knitter did an excellent job knitting it. So they knit their own sampled photograph, and you get to keep yours, which is also nice because then you can wear it around and and have it. Um, you write up the pattern by a certain deadline and send it in, and then they have it tech edited, which means that it's a somebody who is trained to go through a pattern and they don't knit it, but they check all of the math uh, to make sure that it works, that all the stitch counts, all the gauge, all of that works, that the, you know, the sizing all makes sense, that the instructions are clear, that nothing is left out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so the tech editor goes over it, gets back in touch with you, the designer, about, you know, here are some things that need fixing. You make all of those changes and go back and forth with the tech editor a bit if you need to, like if you have some questions or disagreement about what the tech editor is saying. And uh, and then they make the all the final changes to the pattern. And then that was pretty much it for my end. Um, until the pattern came out yesterday. And then I, and often this will be the case even with a professional publication or a big yarn company, they wanted the designers to put up the Ravelry pattern pages. So we all did that. And, um, you know, you put all the details in about the pattern and, uh, and then, you know, let all the social media outlets know about it. So it's, it's really, it's quite a process. I mean, just knitting the sample alone is, you know, what, maybe 10 or 12 hours of knitting. And that's not including ripping it back because, you know, I decided to make some changes or whatever. And, um, and also ripping it back because you need to be fussier about a design sample than you need to be about something you're making for yourself. Um, you know, if you make a mistake, often I would just let it go if it was just something for me. But for a design sample, you really, you need to do it the way the instructions say to make sure it works and to make sure the photographs match the instructions. <laughs> um, so tons of knitting time. I won't even talk about the knitting time on this fingering weight cardigan. That I'm looking at over here. <laughs> wow, but totally worth it. Totally worth it. Uh, so the knitting time, and then writing up the pattern, and you know, checking it all over, and um, you know, doing up a schematic if there is one, doing up a chart if there is one. There weren't either of those in this case. Uh, getting the photography lined up if that's your responsibility, getting the tech editor lined up if that's your responsibility, responding to the tech editor, getting the pattern changed if you're self-publishing, getting it all laid out, getting it uploaded to Ravelry. And then after the fact, this is something I think often gets overlooked, pattern support. So once people start knitting your pattern, then answering questions about, you know, what do you mean when you say this? Or I think there might be an error here or you know, whatever the, the issue might be, which ends up being a fair amount of time too. Not so much for me, but I know for, uh, there was an interesting conversation that Isolde Teague started the other day, I think on the designer forum on Ravelry, about, um, about how she was thinking about raising the prices on her patterns because she spends so much time doing pattern support. She can imagine, right? I mean, she, so many people knit her patterns and she has so many of them. You could imagine how much time she spends a week just responding to knitters' emails. Um, and that's uncompensated time, in a sense, if you are a designer who sold a lot of patterns. In a sense. I mean, it was debatable. There were people going back and forth about whether that made sense or not. But it was interesting. Uh, so, yeah, it's just, it's a lot of... It's a lot of work, to be honest. I mean, I, it's it's work that I really, really enjoy. And it is challenging, like really mentally challenging and uh, mathematically challenging. Doing all of the grading, like 
when you the, the most mathematically challenging part is is the grading. So and grading just means sizing things up and down. So when you design, say, a sweater, the you're not making samples of every size, right? I mean, that would just be insane. Can you imagine if I knit 12 different copies of this fingering weight sweater? <laughs> the expense alone, like nobody would send me yarn support for that. More about yarn support in a moment. Um, but yeah, it would just take forever. So you make one size that you're going to use to for photography, and then you kind of write all the instructions for the others not having knit them. So this is challenging because you have to know enough about standard measurements and about um, the effect that changing one set of numbers has on different parts of the sweater in order to make all the instructions work. And also how to do that without overcomplicating the instructions. Because as soon as you start changing the stitch counts, right, what if you've got a stitch pattern? How do you kind of keep all the stitch counts close to the measurements that they're supposed to be while not overcomplicating the stitch pattern or the shaping? So there's a, there's a lot to think about there. Again, I find it really stimulating. I like that but uh, it is not even remotely simple. And that's sweater patterns. I mean, even something like this requires more thought than you would think. You know, just making sure that each one of these segments is of equal width uh, while still creating a hat that fits around a kind of standard adult head take some thought and how to how to do that in such a way that all the short rows are kind of geometrically or symmetrical but still the right measurement around you know it's it's a, it's a really interesting mental game that you have to play um i guess the last thing i'll say about the whole design process is that i forgot to talk about the yarn support issue which is that well, it's not really an issue but like the the aspect of it that is yarn support when you are designing uh, you don't necessarily need to buy the yarn yourself. You may, when you're first getting started, just to kind of establish yourself a little bit, but if you are working, if you're doing it for a yarn company, obviously they're going to send you the yarn. If you're doing it for a publication, they will typically, they should arrange for yarn support for you, which means having the yarn that you need to knit the sample mailed to you at no cost to you. Uh, if you're doing a self-published design, you can also approach yarn companies, dyers, yourself and say, you know, look, I'm, and, and submit something like what I showed you with the knit picks thing. Here's what I'm thinking about doing. Here's a sketch. Uh, if there's a, a stitch pattern, show them a, a photograph of the swatch. Uh, doesn't have to be in their yarn, but, you know, something comparable. And, um, you know, I'll need, in order to knit a sample for this, I will need, you know, this many yards. And, um, you know, do you think you could support this? And, and you'd be, I mean, if it's a good proposal, you'll generally get the support that you want, unless it's just an outrageous amount of yarn. Um, yeah, and... So, you know, it doesn't have to be, designing is not, does not have to be an expensive process for the designer. Because, you know, if you think about this from the dyer's point of view, having patterns in their yarn makes it easier for them to sell yarn. So there is, it's, it's good business for them to support independent designers, designers in general. So that's basically the process. If you have any, let me know if you have questions about how all of this works or any comments that you want to make about it um because yeah i'd be really interested to talk more about this sometime if there's any kind of follow-up that you want me to do um i think that's it for today i will have a brief technique segment for you here at the end but otherwise i will see you in a couple of weeks i think it's march 6th that i'll be back and i will talk to you soon Hey there, 
So let's take a look at how to join stitches into the round without them twisting and uh, and without having a you know a kind of noticeable jog where you started. So I've just cast on a bunch of stitches onto a 16 inch circular needle and you know the instructions always tell you when you're joining into the round something like join into the round taking care not to twist or being careful not to twist stitches. And when they're talk what they're talking about is that see how the stitches are kind of coiling around the needle if you as and you probably know this already but if you just start knitting this way without paying attention to the way the stitches are oriented you can st end up with this kind of fake mobius that isn't going to make you very happy so what you need to do in order to get started is first of all you notice how when you cast on there is a tiny little bit of fabric that is already coming off the needle what i do is i basically just I've got this turned the wrong way. I turn all of that, all of that fabric, so that it is pointing toward the inside of the needle. So now that whole cast on edge is pointing toward the inside. And then I very carefully get the tail out of the way so you're not hitting with that and start start knitting then. Now if you notice when you've got, gone around one whole round take a cl close look at your knitting and make sure that you haven't twisted your stitches. If you find that you have you can actually untwist it at the end of that first round without there being any really noticeable effect on the knitting. So that's one tip for you. Another one is that if you've got a ton of stitches on the needle and it's really hard, like maybe they're all crammed in or for some reason it's really hard to kind of get them all lined up and be sure that they're not twisted, try just knitting back and forth for a few rows and then join into the round. You can always take that cast on tail later and use it to just seam up that last little bit at the bottom and no one will be the wiser. So how about joining into the round and not having you know how when you join into the round often there's that little jog there when you keep knitting there's a little bit of a a lip where this part is set down a little bit and it just doesn't look there's not a nice continuous line between the beginning and the end so here are a couple of tips for avoiding that one of them is to just slip the first stitch on the very first round you won't do that from then on but just on that very first round, slip the first stitch. And what that does is, and then you just kind of keep, keep working from there. What that does is, is it kind of bridges the gap between here and here. So that there's not, um, because when, whenever you knit a stitch, you're adding a little extra fabric down here. By slipping it, you're not. So it's kind of bridging the gap between these stitches you haven't worked yet and these that you have. And finally, I mean, there are lots of ways to avoid this jog, but here is another one. It's just to cast on one more stitch than you actually need. So if it told you to cast on 100 stitches, cast on 101. And then slip that 101st stitch. It was over here on the right-hand needle. Just slip it purlwise over here onto your left-hand needle and work basically that last stitch that you cast on together with the first stitch that you cast on. Whatever that first stitch is. If it was a if first stitch is a knit, then knit them together. If it's a purl, then purl them together. And then just keep going on. You've decreased that extra stitch away and now you've again kind of bridged that gap between the beginning and the end of the cast on row. All right. I'll see you soon.